All right. Um, I'm going to get started. My name is Jen Silveri. I'm one of the directors of Michigan Food and Farming Systems. I'm excited to welcome you all here today for our webinar about marketing your group gap certification. Um, next slide, please. All right, so um, our agenda for today, we're gonna talk about a little bit about MIFs and then go over Michigan Group Gap Network, uh, talk about the new guide that we've developed in partnership with Michigan Public Health Institute and Fresh Systems, as well as the Michigan Group Gap, Gap Advisory Network. And then we're gonna hear from Eastern Market, Planet Detroit, and do a question to answer. Phil, do you wanna take a brief moment to introduce yourself and Sure. Not the presenters that are with us today. Yeah. Um, so I'm Phil Britton. I'm the director of the Michigan Group Gap Network and the chief ruckus maker at Fresh Systems LLC. Um, so excited to be a part of things today. Um, you'll hear more from me here in a little bit. Yeah, I'm mute, Dan. Next slide, please. Thanks everybody for bearing with us while we get used to all presenting virtually. It's new, usually we're all in the same room together and it's always a learning experience. So Michigan Food and Farming Systems is a statewide nonprofit that connects beginning and historically underserved farmers to each other in social justice for resource sharing and opportunities um, to ensure social justice, environmental stewardship and profitability. Everything we do at MIFS leverages highly collaborative and strategic partnerships to create and enable small networks of small scale urban and rural farms that help us give rise to a more resilient local food system. Um, we work to support entrepreneurial farm de business development by serving as a bridge between resource providers and subject matter, magic matter experts such as USDA, MSU Extension, and wisdom from the diverse communities we work with throughout Michigan. Next slide, please. MSU is an affiliate of Michigan State University through MSU Center for Regional Food Systems. And we are also strategically partnered and co-located with Michigan Public Health Institute. Next slide. We do a wide range of work. Um, most of our work, as I mentioned before, centers around enabling peer-to-peer -peer networks for resource and learning opportunities. Um, we have a Women in Ag network that was born out of Genesee County, as well as Women in Ag Farm Development Center. We also have MIFS Vets and Ag network, a veterans network, and we have a Latino and Spanish-speaking farmers network called Red de Productores Hispanos. And there's another one that is the Southwest Mission Michigan contingency, and that's Agricultores Latinos Unidos. Um, we also were a catalyzing partner and uh, work with diverse stakeholders to support the Michigan Group Gap Network. Um, the majority of our outreach and technical assistance and advocacy stems from farm bill programming. Um, so we do a lot of groundwork and technical assistance delivery to historically underserved farmers around how to access farm bill programs and work with local USDA service centers, how to apply for programs. Um, we also host the annual Michigan Family Farms Conference. MIFS is the original small farm and sustainable agriculture organization in Michigan. Um, we started in the mid 90s and have been hosting the Michigan Family Farms Conference for over 15 years. And it brings together an extremely diverse cohort of producers and food systems folks um, from across the spectrum to learn from each other and collaboratively talk about ways to address challenges and opportunities that are coming up for us. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over for the rest of the webinar, thanks. All right, thank you, Jen. So Michigan Group Gap Network. Um, thank you all for hopping on uh, or watching later, whichever you are doing right now. And um, also want to say too, if you have any questions at any time throughout the webinar, feel free to drop them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will either get to them at the end or they'll be answered in the Q&A. So 
The Michigan Group Gap Network, um, kind of like Jen said, is a collaborative network of technical service providers and internal auditors. Um, it is all based around uh, the USDA Group Gap, uh, USDA Group Gap Small Farm Food Safety Certification Program. So it's it's rather than it being a different audit type, so it is a different method for small producers to become certified in food safety by the USDA. So I've shown these um, I've shown these diagrams probably a million times, but if this is, if this is your first time seeing them, kind of in the the solo gap, the more traditional model, you have a certifying body like the USDA go into a producer performing an audit, looking over all their procedures, their records, uh, watching them in their practices, all that kind of stuff to, it, to verify that they meet their acceptance criteria. If they do, they're issued a certification. If they don't, they are um, you know, issued corrective actions and those are worked through and the process starts again. In the group gap model, that is spread out a little bit more. And so you have a group of producers working together kind of under some kind of group framework that's managed by a quality management system. That group then goes and performs internal audits on each of the producers. And what the USDA's role then is not to certify the individual producers, but they certify the system, that the system is working properly. And they do that by looking at the group's procedures and records at kind of like the group administration level. And then they will also pick a sample size or a sample of the producers and perform an external audit on them. And then kind of like um, look at the internal and external audits, compare them, see if there's any discrepancies. If everything looks good and it meets their acceptance criteria, then they issue a certification to the whole group. And that brings all the benefits of, you know, collaboratively working together, um, resource sharing. You know, the Michigan Group Gap Network is a, a collaboration right now between organizations like MIFS, they've been a, a major supporter since day one, um, MSU Extension, um, Kalamazoo Valley Community College, uh, and, and others as well. So that's kind of what the Michigan Group Gap Network is all about. So today, um, talking about certification, um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, well, this guide is... Uh, let me, let me back up a little bit. So with the Group Gap Network, with the Group Gap Project, initially at, at, day, at the beginning, what we were trying to do is um, help farmers, small farms get more market access, right? That's kind of the whole role of certification. Um, you have a buyer who is asking for some sort of verification, some sort of certification, you know, the buyer themselves, they're not going out to your farm. They want some kind of assurance that you have implemented and are following best practices to keep foodborne pathogen contamination, you know, like E. coli, Listeria, Seminola, all those off of your produce, right? And the best way they can do that, the best way they can get that assurance is through some kind of certification, some kind of verification program that somebody has looked over your processes and they say, yep, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So that's kind of the, the, the role of certification. And so years ago, when we started the Group Gap program, we're like, um, there were these buyers who were asking for certification, but it was kind of hard for small farms, small and mid-scale farms to, to get that certification years ago. Um, and so we're like, great, uh, we want them to be able to sell to these buyers. So let's help them get certified. And so we did that. But what we've kind of found in the years since is that, um, that that market access piece hasn't quite materialized. Right, so there's, it's not, it's not just like all of a sudden once you're certified, boom, you have market access. Not always, um, and so what this this particular project started as was let's let's try to build something that addresses that that problem that helps close that loop or helps cross that proverbial last mile of food safety certification. That's what this guy is aiming to do. So who's it for? It's for producers who either are or are planning to in the near future become food safety certified. Um, and what's it, what's it for? It's guidance on leveraging your certification for market access. So it's designed to, to kind of be that starting point of like, okay, you've, you've went through all the hard work of getting certified, now what? This is what this guide is aiming to answer and start the conversation on. So let's get into it. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, um, that I'm going to do then is, um, oh, also I should say too that this guide is published as of today. 
It is live on this website. We'll drop the link in the chat and uh, share it throughout our networks as well after the webinar. But um, what we're hoping to do with this webinar is just to kind of give a brief overview of some of the, the high points of it. Um, and then we want to talk to a couple of practitioners about um, their experience with GAP certification, how that has influenced uh, their engagement with buyers, all of that stuff. Um, so just so to start, you know, who, who is asking for certification? You know, who we talk about buyers asking for FUSITA certification, who really are they? And one way to help frame that question is to talk about risk. You know, I, like, I like talking about risk. And um, a couple of different ways you can think about it are the risk to the customer or the risk to the buyer themselves. And one is that if the buyer is going to be, you know, buying your produce and then selling it to or in, in distributing it to customers who either have an underdeveloped or compromised immune system, you know, if you're selling to like a hospital or schools or things like that, um, that increases that level of risk, right? You kind of want a little bit more assurance that, you know, you've done everything you can to keep foodborne pathogens off of your produce. Another way to think about it too is if the, the buyer is then either maybe commingling the produce with stuff from other farms and then spreading it out to a, a large population base, it can also have a big impact if there's any kind of issue. You know, so again, wanting that level of assurance. And then also maybe if a buyer is buying from a lot of suppliers, um, that, that could potentially, if somebody gets sick from their produce, that could potentially open them up to some liability. So again, um, wanting to, to find ways to help mitigate that risk, both to their customer base and to themselves from a liability standpoint. Um, There's one way to help frame that question. Those are kind of more of the buyers that are asking for some level of food safety certification. There's obviously lots of other factors, but that's one um, helpful way, in my opinion, to start thinking about that question. And then what do they ask for? You know, they're always going to ask for your certificate, for your certification. Many certifiers, USDA included, have an online database that you can also point buyers to that will say, you know, here's my farm name. Here's uh, the scope of my certification. Here's what commodities are covered under my certification. Here's what my last audit was. All this information can be found online. And you can also send them a copy of your paper certificate as well. Some buyers might also ask for your most a copy of your most recent audit report so they can really drill down on you know, what's going on in your farm. And then the usual additional documentation too, like proof of insurance and the usual stuff like that is kind of what they're typically asking for. Next slide. So um, in that, you know, once, once we're talking about who's asking for it, um, one of the first questions that comes up is, well, what if, what if the certification I have doesn't match the certification they're asking for? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different certifications out there. And, you know, what if, what if uh, there's that discrepancy there? What, what happens? And there's a few different things you can do. Um, and they all kind of revolve around a conversation. And the first thing could be, you could ask them, you know, why do you require that specific certification? One of the things that um, some of my colleagues at MSU who have been doing some buyer research lately have been finding is that um, a lot of times the people who are interacting with the suppliers aren't totally familiar with the, the vast you know, variety of food safety certifications that are out there. And, um, you know, so they might just be, well, this is what we've always done. You know, the, the first buyers or the first suppliers we were working with were asking for this specific certification. So we just rolled with it and we're using that one now. Or, you know, somebody in our compliance department saw that this one had the most checklist questions. So we're picking that one. You know, so why are they asking for that specific certification? And then once you have that why, you can describe why you chose the certification that you did. Um, in some level, certification is a value statement, right? You're saying this is important to me. This is uh, why, you know, why am I choosing to do this? And so you can say, well, you know, I know you're asking for this certification, but I decided to go with, you know, uh, shameless plug. I decided to go with the group gap program because I wanted to be part of a network. I want to be part of a collaboration and work with work together. I like, you know, the things that they're doing. So I, I chose to go that certification route. And that might be enough to be like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense and that, that's okay. Um, your certification administrator, you know, so in a group gap context myself, I'd be happy to talk to any buyer and say, you know, we both have the same goal here of mitigating foodborne pathogen contamination risk on this produce. And I can show you how the certification that we offer 
is working towards that same goal that the one you're asking for is. Um, you know, those conversations would be happy to have and, and other certification administrators would be happy to have that as well. And then, you know, if, if they're not gonna budge, you can always say, okay, well, I'm certified here now. I'm happy to switch next audit cycle. You know, is it okay if we have a temporary exception for, for this time around? So those are just some of the things you can start with um, to engage with your buyer on, on that front. If those certifications don't match, if there's a discrepancy there. There's obviously more routes you can go, but this is a good starting point. Um, but having that conversation is a, a great place to start. Next slide. So we've talked about um, you know, who's asking for certification, what are the kind of buyers that are asking for it, um, and how that, that risk profile looks. We've talked about what happens if there's a discrepancy between what they're asking for and what you've been certified in. Um, but let's talk about like having that out further. You know, we had the conversation with um, with the buyers. But what about the marketing that out further? Um, you know, like I said, a certification that is a value statement. You can talk about that on your website or talk about that on social media. You know, you can you can talk about why you chose to be GAP certified and what that means to you and, and why you're pursuing this route. You know, it's a lot of work, so we might as well talk about it and and and, um, and, and talk about. Uh, what the process was like, you know, you can be have fun with it. You can take a selfie with the auditor if you want. <laughs> when you're getting your audit, you can um, you can show some behind the scenes uh, things, uh, views of your processes and, and what it takes to go, or what it, the different processes that you've implemented to, to become certified and what you have to do day to day to maintain that certification. You can shed some light behind the scenes on that. Um, there's also, Packaging, you can edit to your label, your, la your labeling on your packaging uh, with a caveat. And we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk with um, Simon and Meg. But um, the, a lot of certifiers will have sp specific requirements about how and when you can use any kind of logo. So, for example, the USDA has requirements on when you can use their USDA GAP logo on your packaging. And the reason they have those in place is because they don't want something being labeled, you know, USDA GAP certified that actually isn't covered under your certification. And so those will include things like making sure all your labels are accounted for and that you have procedures on what, that specify what those labels can go on and what the logo can be used on and, and when it can be used on and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that actually becomes then part of your audit every year. And then other materials such as, you know, if you have rat cards or flyers at the farmer's market, you can talk about it on there. You can talk about it on your signage. Um, you can talk about it in other forms of messaging. You know, if there's a national food safety outbreak or something like that, you can reassure your customers that, hey, we're GAP certified. We've um, taken steps to implement these best practices on our farm to keep that risk low, all that kind of stuff. You can just talk about the work that you've done. Give yourself kudos for it because it's not an easy undertaking. So those are some of the things that you can do talking about uh, taking it out further. So, and that was kind of just, a, again, a brief overview of some of the things that are in the, um, the guide. Oh, there's one more slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, my internet is really bad, so uh, I'm doing this on my phone, so I don't have like a, a separate screen to <laughs> keep tabs on where we're at. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, again, engaging with buyers, talking to your customers, talking about your certification more widely, uh, and then just finally going forward from the first year of certification. Certifications are an annual thing. So, you know, keeping your food safety plan up to date, keeping your good records um, will, will work, help you work towards renewing your certification every year. Um, there's also a uh, continuous improvement aspect to this too. You know, after your audit, you're kind of given a list of things where, you know, you can improve on. So between that audit and your next one, you can work on implementing new things, making things more, um, more uh, ingrained in your everyday processes and your operation. And then also there's the whole, like building a culture of food safety side of things. One of my favorite definitions of culture is people like us do things like this. And so if you're talking about your food safety certification, you're like, yeah, we got GAP certified, we've implemented these practices, we keep good records, and here's why, here's why it's important to us, all that kind of stuff. That begins to impact your peers as well, right? 
And it starts to build that, you know, yeah, this food safety thing is just something that we do. It's just, it's natural. Um, and that has, you know, the obvious public health benefits of that, but also it kind of um, helps reinforce and build just the culture of food safety across, across the whole board. And finally, anytime that you take an intentional uh, focused approach towards building out your systems, documenting processes, keeping good records, all that kind of stuff, it's gonna have a lot of benefits beyond just the achieving a certification. You know, you're gonna, it's gonna make um, training new employees way easier. It's gonna make planning for the next year much better, much more accurate. It's gonna make um, your, your operation more efficient because things are being done the same way every time, no matter who's doing it, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of intrinsic benefits to going through a process like this beyond just achieving the certification. So that was just a quick uh, and brief high level overview of the things that are in the guide. Um, feel free to look into it more once it gets more out there in the world. Um, and again, it's meant just to be a starting point, just the uh, beginning scaffold to help close that loop, help cross that last mile of food safety certification. Um, we'd love more feedback on it. There's contact information in the, the guide itself. Um, and love to see where it goes from here. So now, um, next slide, please. I would love to talk to some of our practitioners about what their experience was like going through GAP certification and, um, and how they have been how they've used it in their marketing efforts and how they've been engaging with buyers and stuff like that. So first up is Christine with Eastern Market. And um, yeah, we can start by just telling us a little bit about Eastern Market and what you're doing and how this came to be. Great. Uh, hey everyone, I'm uh, Christine Kwan. I'm the Food Hub and Innovation Director at Eastern Market. And um, <clears throat> we, uh, got into, we had wanted to do a food box for a long time and um, just didn't have the top side uh, green light to do that until the pandemic hit, quite frankly. And um, so come mid-March, um, my boss, Dan Carmody said, we, we need to put a food ba box together. We need to put the market online. You have 10 days. Go. So it was uh, quite a process um, to get started, uh, but um, we have developed a, a, a food box program that has now taken on a life of its own. And when we were currently making food boxes for a Saturday curbside program, we also um, applied to and was awarded the USDA Farmers to Families program. So the USDA program was a, uh, for those not familiar with it, uh, if you recall in the early days of the pandemic, um, because of supply chain pivots in for farmers, farmers were plowing under acres of produce because they couldn't uh, pivot to grocery retailers and uh, in time and at the same time, um, food banks were coming up short with, with food. And so the USDA Farmers Family Program was a solution in which uh, distributors, produce distributors, food hubs, and other nonprofits, and actually in some cases some farms, could uh, put together a, a produce box and get it to people who were food insecure. So Eastern Market did uh, 2,000 boxes a week in that USDA program, partnering with 12 different nonprofit program or nonprofit partners. Um, and what was great about our program was that uh, we weren't working with the food bank system. They were already being covered by other distributors. And this helped us go a level deeper into food insecurity in the city of Detroit. It allowed us to get on the front lines of, of neighborhood food insecurity. And, and for those of you who are unaware of Detroit, we do have transportation issues and, and connecting to food banks in a lot of situations for Detroiters was tough. So we literally brought food to neighborhoods in the city of Detroit, 2000 boxes a week. Um, but uh, as part of that USDA program, um, we needed to get GAP certified. Uh, they were willing to accept us um, into the program 
with the promise that we would follow through and get our GAP certification. So, um, so that's what kind of got us into, into the mix of, of doing it. Um, and it's not that it was something that I didn't want to do eventually, um, but we were new to making food boxes. And had I had a little bit more of a runway, I probably would have, you know, in all honesty, probably put it off to year two. I wouldn't have just started making food boxes in the beginning of May and then by August go for a GAP certification. But here we are. So, um, but I had been on the outskirts of, of GAP certification and knowing what, in, and attended a few classes and I knew what, what, what needed to be done. Um, but that's, that's what motivated us to get into it. And, and also knowing now that we have this, that qualifies us for future USD programs. And that's where really, I think that, I mean, not just maintaining a high food safety game, but the access to be able to easily uh, apply for future USDA grant programming um, is, is a clear benefit for us. Um, and also like now that we have it and we are, you know, penetrating new markets with our food box, this opens us up to, you know, connecting with more institutions. So one of the programs that we're hoping to connect to um, in, in 2021 is uh, healthcare systems. And so, um, you know, we're, you know, we're also making boxes for fresh prescription boxes as well. So, you know, once, so now that we're kind of, we have our GAP certification, this allows us to get into the market where we can connect to people who are, um, who are vulnerable and at most at risk for food safety. So um, that's kind of where I think the overall direction, the purpose, and kind of where we where we are with the program. Awesome. <laughs> and as far as the ease of doing it, I, um, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I, not just because you're on this webinar with us, John McCarthy, but um, he I mean, I had to write the SOPs. I had to put the food safety plan together, but without the help of John helping me like tie in all of this information that we were already doing and lay it out in a way that could just make the, the whole audit go so quickly, so smoothly. I mean, he was, he was exactly what I needed when I needed it because, you know, each, each section of, of the gap audit is ties back to a specific question. And it was great to just organize all of our stuff in a way that we could just get through the audit quickly. So um, it really made it quite easy. Like I, you know, he laid out the path in front of me and it was a matter of me taking the steps. So, you know, I didn't have to invent anything new or do anything new and, um, and, it really wasn't that hard, I, I gotta say. I mean, we were doing things right, but with a few tweaks here and there, it wasn't hard. Was there anything that surprised you in the process? Yeah, how easy it was. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, I think it starts with doing the right thing to start with um, and having, you know, I have a, I'm ServSafe certified and I have the saying that like, once you know food safety, you can't unknow food safety. And so, you know, um, so starting from the get-go, I, I had a good sense of where we were going and what we needed to do, but um, getting everything together in the package that is the gap audit and the, in doing things the gap way, um, it wasn't such a hard pivot, to be honest with you. So um, I think that there's a lot of people and there's a lot of myths out there about how darn difficult this is. And um, I, I really, it's not. Mm -hmm. At least it wasn't for us. So when, it, when you talk about um, engaging with buyers, um, are 
how has how has that side of things went? Um, you know, are you is your the primary? Let me rephrase that. Is the primary buyer you're dealing with on a gap from a gap standpoint the USDA, or are you having that conversation now with others, saying like, hey, we're gap certified now, we can do these other new things? Right. Um, so I mentioned that we are looking to get into healthcare situations and you know in healthcare markets. So. Yes, we, we did it for USDA, but now we're doing it for healthcare markets. And eventually, you know, post pandemic, we hope to be able to connect even more into institutions and schools. So, you know, this, this allows us to kind of get into some new markets that weren't previously accessible to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the sense too is, I, I feel that even the partners that we're working with at any time, it, it's almost like an insurance to keep the business that we do have too. Because at any point, at any time, any one of our partners could say, you know, we now have a new rule that we're only working with GAP distributors. And if you're not GAP, then we can't do business with you anymore. So I feel like some, a very important part of getting GAP certified is to keep the business that you already have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so in, in your talking with buyers, like what are they typically asking for? You know, if you're starting those conversations with schools and hospitals, are they just asking for the cert or they're asking for more stuff? Um, they're just asking for the cert and I, I don't, feel that buyers necessarily know even what it is that gap is. I think that mostly what they're looking for is to push off risk mitigation. I think that's what it comes down to for them. Um, and so it's up to us to kind of, um, you know, teach them our own, you know, I think it's just a way for us to say that food safety, that we're conscious of it, that we work towards it every day and the certification is is just evidence of our following those guidelines. And and I, to be honest with you, I think that probably most people who we who are buyers don't know all the things that we do and and why and the why. And I don't know if they even necessarily need to know. They just want to know that we're doing it. That's mm -hmm. it. That's and that's it's it's baseline now. Mm -hmm. Um, how did, how did implementation go, um, without, throughout your, your staff? I mean, how many, how much, many staff do you have that are involved in the food box program and how did it, how did it go with like training on the documentation that you were writing and stuff like that? Well, we do, um, we have the good fortune of having a food safety, um, company that works with us in partnership with. Um, our Detroit Kitchen Connect program. And so we put together a food safety, food handlers, special program for our food and health fellows that we hire every year. So we kind of tweaked the program to kind of specifically um, focus on producing food boxes, but lots of it were the same. You know, when we were talking about hygiene and, and um, employee illness and those types of things, those are things that we had already touched upon. So you know, we were just, we just had to apply it to packing food boxes and it was not an issue. So, you know, those are, so we could train our folks, they get a certificate at the end of the program. Um, and then it's just a matter of training the right way to, to, to pack a box. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what advice would you give somebody who is thinking about getting GAP certified and specifically on that engaging with buyers piece? Uh, the advice is to fully connect to MIFS and to, or, or to the Michigan Group Gap and to connect with John and to get an internal auditor to help you. Um, it was great to have somebody walk through our process with us and look over all of my standard operating procedures and my policies and make sure that, you know, I was on target um, and uh, there's, a, you know, there's resources, there's, you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, and it's, it's not as hard as you think. So um, that, 
you know, to just do it. Uh, that would be my, my advice. And as far as talking to buyers, um, I think the most important thing that buyers need to know is that, that, that you have the certification that you went through the process and that, you know, food safety is a priority and woven into your daily production processes. Um, and, and those who are in the, who are buying for vulnerable populations already know that the weight of the gap certification or should know the weight of the gap certification. And if not, you know, you can direct them to what it means, but, um, I think it's definitely uh, it's definitely within reach. And if I can do it, starting production in May and getting certified in August, you know, anyone can do it. Cool. Anything else you want to add? No, I think people are probably done hearing from me. <laughs> but I'm happy, oh. like. Um, you know, flash my email if anybody has any questions, uh, you know, I'm happy to share any of my operating procedures for those who are packing boxes or, or you know, doing packing. Um, if there's any way that I can be a resource to anybody, I'm, I'm happy to put myself out there. Well, that's awesome. Appreciate that. Thank you, Christine. And if you have any um, questions for Christine, you can also drop those in the Q&A as well. Um, maybe John can put her contact info um, in the yep. chat as well. Sweet. And we were audited the same day as, as our friends here at Planted Detroit. So, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they did mention they had another operation they were doing in the area. So, I guess that, that was, was us. Yeah. No, we, we try to uh, schedule audits in the same regions uh, at the same times as much as possible to help keep costs down. So, that's great. So yeah, well, we can kick it over to, to Simon and Meg at Planted Detroit. Um, so whoever wants to, feel free to take it away and, and tell us a little bit about your operation. Awesome. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you to the other panelists for, uh, for your presentations. Really informative. Um, a bit about us. Uh, we are a vertical farm, which means we're growing uh, leafy greens, um, mainly baby greens, herbs, uh, and microgreens uh, indoors in a controlled environment using LED lights and hydroponics. Um, this allows us to grow 365 days a year um, with no change in seasonality um, and to use less resources for every pound of food that we do grow versus uh, you know, traditional uh, outdoor agriculture. Um, We've been operating since 2018. Uh, we were mainly uh, selling to uh, restaurants uh, and then the pandemic happened and we made a shift. It was uh, a bit of a rush on a planned shift that we had to uh, go more toward direct consumer products. Uh, specifically, uh, right now we're focused on our ready to eat salad line. We have uh, right now four SKUs, different uh, salads, ready to eat packaged with uh, different ingredients that we source sometimes from Eastern Market and from a, a local dressing manufacturer as well. Um, and we're selling through our website and through uh, third party uh, services as well, such as Eastern Market, mm -hmm. uh, food boxes and a few other um, in, in the region. Um, well, we chose to get Z uh, GAP certified um, for, for a few reasons. So because we are a vertical farm, First, uh, second, we are uh, a harvester of our own product. Uh, we pack our own product and we deliver our own product. So we really fall into a, a large umbrella of, of different certifications that we could possibly get into. Um, of course, we're, we're also certified as a uh, wholesale food processor through MDARD, but our, our first certification uh, was actually GAP through the, through the group GAP network. Um, we chose this because, uh, and Meg will touch on this later, being a federal uh, agency, uh, it's really recognizable to the customer. Uh, you say USDA, basically everybody knows, uh, everybody has heard that term either in reference to the quality of a steak or uh, you know just general oversight of an operation. Um, we, it was really helpful for us to participate in the group uh, as well. 
um, John was able, like uh, Christine said, to you know really guide us through that process and help us out. Um, you know, my 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 background in, in food safety allowed us to already have a little bit of a head start as far as uh, SOPs and uh, food safety plan, which is really in place before our GAP certification, but it was uh, amended definitely, you know, based on advice we got from the group government network to uh, better facilitate that certification in the audit process. Um, the certification process itself was really not, not painful at all. Um, I essentially was responsible for all of it. It wasn't, um, uh, you know, a it wasn't an extremely heavy lift. You know, there were uh, many hours spent making sure all our paperwork was aligned and there weren't any gaps in logs and we had everything we needed. Um, but it's, it was really helpful to show us where our gaps existed and where we had, you know, generally, genuinely might have food safety concerns that we might not have addressed had we not done an audit. Um, so I think that was uh, really, really important and beneficial for us, um, you know, and for any other facility to really get you thinking about the whole process because once you're involved in it and, and your head is down and you're going forward, it's sometimes tough to take a step back and, and review everything as a whole. Um, so that's what I think it definitely gave us a bird's eye view of our own operation, which can sometimes get tough when you're in the, in the weeds. Um, I do think it was uh, relatively easy. Um, like I said, we don't fall under, and I'm sure Christine can, uh, can uh, uh, you know, back this up. We don't fall under the purview of a, of a regular farm that, you know, some of these audits are designed for. So it was, a, we had to kind of amend, um, you know, the, how we, how we went about the, the audit process to uh, address how, for example, uh, field sanitation units uh, really don't apply to us, but, you know, we had different ways to get around that and demonstrate that we do have proper you know, sanitation units for our things. Um, as far as surprises, not really. Uh, the audit checklist was really simple. I was able to go through it, you know, by myself several times before we were even audited by John or the USDA auditor who came through. Uh, Bob, I believe was his name. So I felt really well prepared. There wasn't anything in the conversation when he sat down and asked me a question and I was, you know, completely taken aback, um, which, would not, which would not be a good thing, but fortunately that didn't happen. Um, yeah, and I, I think now I'll, I'll pass it over to Meg and uh, yeah, let her uh, kind of go from here. Yeah, so thanks, Simon. I'm Meg. I lead the business development here at Planted, and we are we're thrilled to be part of the Group Gap Network. It's such a good fit for us because, like Simon was mentioning, we're a very unique type of farm, and we have to lead with definitions of what we do because people don't understand it at the outset. Not being traditional agriculture, um, I came from a background of. Uh, sort of big ag, big business food buying and knew for a fact that we would have to have a certification to get in the door if we wanted to sell through traditional channels like into, a, for example, a retail chain. We aren't in one right now, but perhaps in the future. And I knew that there would be a question of, do we have GAP or do we have SQF? So we were thrilled to be able to find group GAP as it's a perfect fit for where we are now in terms of size. And when we began, of course, the group GAP process, we were even smaller than we are today. Um, and then where we hope to be, it sort of bridges that gap um, as we scale, which is our goal. Um, it's really helpful for us specifically because when people are, learn about our unique type of agriculture, first of all, not everybody knows what vertical farming is. So they have that explanation. Not everyone understands hydroponics as it has evolved into today. Um, and then people don't really, understand what microgreens and how we micro baby greens indoors. And then for those who do understand, they understand the risk that's inherent. And that's part of why we have Simon here and his food safety expertise, but having the GAP certification backing up the fact that we are extremely safe in how we go about growing the greens that we grow is essential for me as I conduct those conversations with our customers. Because anyone who knows anything about growing microgreens or sprouts indoors knows that essentially we're creating the perfectly fertile environment where we could grow bacteria or other things like that. So at a base level, we want people to understand that we take food safety so seriously, like it's in our DNA. It is a non-negotiable every single day. Um, and that is what essentially that USDA GAP logo on our packaging allows us to convey that in a very short and sweet conversation. 
Um, so there, the conversation around how we market it, that's really the primary way that we do. Um, first of all, in conversation with those bigger buyers, those that are knowledgeable about what group gap might imply, um, but then also on our packaging. And so like Simon said, we sell directly to our consumers primarily through our web store portal right now. Um, and then we also hope to sell through a few other venues as well. And we want people to know just at a glance, even before they turn the package over, right? It's on our label, which is on the top of the package that we are USDA GAP certified. So folks know that we're not just, you know, someone trying to grow a few microgreens in their basement, right? We're serious about making sure that we grow both delicious as well as extremely safe product. Mm -hmm. and one uh, common thread that I'm seeing between your uh, implementation and also Eastern Market is that you already had a lot of things in place. You know, you were already, um, putting a lot of these practices in place and following these guidelines and doing this kind of stuff. And what you really brought in was, you know, yeah, a little bit of maybe SOP writing and stuff like that, but you brought in that verification and component was the biggest thing. Um, you know, one thing I'd love to hear a little bit more about too is what was the, you know, because you, you I think you're the only member of the group that is using the USDA GAP logo on your packaging. What was that process like? Um, actually, getting the logo on the package was quite simple. Um, I needed to fill out a form uh, to get permission to use it. Um, and to, you know, uh, in addition to the form, we had to create an SOP as far as uh, how we use the label, when we use it, um, size, color, um, what, how we control it, like you mentioned before. Um, a couple emails and a signature, and we were off to the races. Um, and now it's printed on all our labels really prominently. And uh, it's, it really warms my heart to see it on there. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, Meg, you mentioned a second ago that um, you saw GAP certification as, you know, what would get you in the door to these conversations with buyers. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Is that like, are you saying that if, if you don't have a GAP certification that those conversations just end immediately? Or how does, how does that work? For sure. And having been on the other side of the desk, um, I was the one delivering that unfortunate news in the past, right? Buying for big retailers, or I, I also bought for a, a meal kit company that distributed nationally. We wanted so desperately to work with small growers and often loved their product, right? Delicious, growing beautiful specialty varietals. But we couldn't in good conscience buy it, touch it, process it, make it what we needed it to be, and then distribute it again to our customers and have faith that that would be safe for our customers unless we saw something like the GAP logo, understanding what goes into that process. And of course, it can be a challenge, right? For many reasons, some of which Simon and Christine touched on, writing the SOPs can be difficult, having an understanding of food safety, implementing that food safety daily, those are the biggest ones, but then there also are financial impediments. And I think that was always my biggest challenge as a buyer is like not wanting to send someone out to SQF if that was our only option, knowing that that might either cripple a small farmer if they were willing to go towards it or we would just have to turn it them away. Um, so now being on this side of the table and selling the delicious things that we grow here in Detroit, I wanted to make sure that I could just head those conversations off at the pass and it also then gives us an opportunity to say to a buyer that maybe doesn't want to come into our farm or doesn't live in Detroit, doesn't follow us on social media and see what we do. They can just look at that certification and know um, that we're really taking things seriously. And we're not, you know, we're not growing this in our bathtub as, as we used to joke as a buyer. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, do you, how do you talk about food safety on like your social media and other places like that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we've talked about it all along and, and we, we, are, we always take an approach at Atlanta Detroit of trying to teach people not just about what we do and specifically what we grow, but about the industry as a whole because indoor growing is kind of, you know, we're like in our teen years, I would say, right? Like we're sort of emerging, um, but a lot of people don't know. And so we want to show people that while what we're doing is very, very different, it's also very accessible. So we show just images like you have up here on the slide. We do show some of the food safety processes that we go through. Simon's written some blog posts that we share and re just reshare through our social networks about exactly how we approach food safety. Um, we try and just answer any questions that folks have as well. There's an interesting thing that happens in vertical farming, especially for us, because we're growing these really specialty crops. People assume 
um, that we are organic and we're not, um, but we're not certified organic, but we're herbicide and pesticide free. So in some ways we align with what consumers are looking for when it comes to organics. Um, so it's great for us to be able to, to back that up with our food safety chops and the GAP certification as well. Yes, maybe we're not USDA organic certified, but we're USDA GAP certified. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, you know, also what, what advice would you give somebody who's thinking about getting GAP certified and also on that, both from the implementing it in your processes, but also on um, what that means to you, what the, how that affects your conversations with buyers? For sure. I mean, I, I would tell another farmer in our shoes to absolutely pursue it, right? From the accessibility perspective of affordability, um, the accessibility of how to go about it, right? The, the services that John has provided for us as well as for Christine and for any other group gap members, just to take you through that process before the auditor steps foot onto your farm to like assage your concerns, to assure you that the food safety processes that you have in place are indeed the right ones. That's a huge advantage. And, and it, it, it's not so much about um, being able to go to the buyer and say we're GAP certified so much as just to be able to be GAP certified before they even ask a question. So you don't have to be on the defensive. That way it's all about selling your product, making sure that you get your delicious produce in front of, you know, some more Michiganders that want to eat locally. Awesome. Um, anything else you, either of you want to add? No, I think, uh, I think we're kind of okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, super, super great info. Thank you for sharing about what you're doing. Um, are there, we can go to the next slide. Are there any questions that anybody has? Anything that's been dropped in the Q&A box for Jen or myself or either of our other panelists? No questions yet in the chat box. Um, attendees, if you want to ask a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat or raise your hand and I can unmute you so that you can ask it live. Um, while we're waiting to see if any questions fell in, um, I just wanna take a moment to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and the depth of knowledge and wealth that you've shared with, each, with all of us. Um, it's excellent information. To let those that are on the webinar know, we will be sending out um, a follow-up email with the link to PowerPoint slides, as well as a link to the guide. I also dropped a guide link into the chat. Um, I'm gonna do that again right now so that you have access to that and can download it. Um, this is our first draft run of it. So if you have any questions, please let us know or feedback for improvement. And we will definitely take those into consideration um, as well as if you have any needs for outreach or questions regarding Michigan Group Gap Network. I have Thanks. a question for John. John, what do you think is the, um, the thing that you find most when you're helping folks or auditing folks, the thing that they might have neglected or didn't think about going into it um, from your experience of, of working with all of us is, do you see any like standout things of? Um, I think, uh, well, first the, the easiest way to get through an audit is to have your records just on par, like having those ready to go, I think is one of the great things that you were mentioning. Um, the one, there's one question about um, a response plan for bathrooms, which I know it sounds small, but um, that's one that people don't like, I think that's one that I've, I've checked off a couple times for different farms in Michigan, just because it was overlooked. Um, like if you're, you're just not looking for it and you know, I just point it out and take the points off. And then the next time we, we have it all set. But mostly, I, I think it was that response plan. Um, and uh, just having records all, all in line makes it a lot easier. All right. 
Um, we still don't have any questions in the chat box. So if you guys are all set, we want to say thank you again for joining us. Um, any of the panelists have any final words they want to share with everybody before we let you go? Just want to say thanks to everyone. Thanks to you to our panelists. Thank you, Christine and Simon and Meg and John for running it and Jen for co-hosting. Yeah, and thank you all as well. We really appreciate uh, you know being part of Group Gap and uh, all the help you guys have offered. It's really been a help to us. Awesome. Thanks. We really appreciate it too. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. I think we're done recording. All right. Just I just hit stop. <clears throat> is um is a link to the recording going to be shared as well? Yeah. So um just to let you guys know, I'm gonna.